It's a beautiful Sunday afternoon here in good old Georgetown, Guyana. Good afternoon to everyone joining us across uh, YouTube and Facebook. It's United Nations Day. So happy UN Day to all of you joining us. And we've got some special folks uh, joining us today from the United Nations here in Guyana. So we'll be discussing the United Nations. It was back in 1945 that the charter was signed, which really put the United Nations into action. And so we'll be talking a bit about that this afternoon, about the various agencies uh, that fall on the United Nations and what those agencies do and the role they have been playing here in Guyana over the years. And uh, so we have uh, joining us the United uh, Nations, sorry, that's the United Nations resident coordinator here in Guyana, Yesmin Uruk. Uh, we also have joining us Irfan Akhtar. He is the, in charge of UNICEF here in Guyana, the UNICEF representative. We also have the FAO representative, Dr. Jillian Smith. And we also have uh, joining us uh, Roberta Natalio, uh, the chief of mission for the International Organization for Migration. So we've got it all covered this afternoon. Those are four of the big agencies that fall under the United Nations here in Guyana. And so we'll be having a discussion uh, with them about the work that the UN have been doing, the UN has been doing in Guyana over the years. And of course, you can play your part too uh, by sending the questions you might have on the United Nations, the questions you might have on the role that they have been playing here in Guyana. And of course, we'll try to get all of those questions answered. So first of all, I'd like to welcome, again, I spoke to her on the radio a few weeks back, and I also spoke to the FAO representative as part of Agriculture Month. Uh, so I'm gonna first welcome Ms. Yuzmik Oruk, the UN resident coordinator here in Guyana. How are you doing? Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon, Gordon. It's always a great pleasure to talk to you. And before we start talking about the UN, I just want to thank you for your thoughtful coverage of many of the issues that we care about. Recently, you covered the Food Month. You've covered issues that are related to migrants, refugees in this country. You've covered issues about criminal justice. So a lot of this uh, programming that you do has been very thoughtful and very, very important to us. Um, today is sort of our birthday. It's the UN Day. So I cannot imagine a better um, um, host with whom to celebrate today. Um, 75 years ago, 76 years ago, um, we emerged out of um, the, the desperation of people from war as, as a vehicle of hope, as the Secretary General said, for people who experience catastrophic conflict. Um, today, it's very important to me to be joined with my colleagues here as we reaffirm our commitment to the ideals of the Charter, to the values, the principles of the UN Charter. What are these? It's human rights. It's the equal rights of men and women. It's human dignity. It is the rights of nations, large and small, equal voice of nations, large and small. It is about peace. And it is about our commitment to create a better world for men, women, and children that live everywhere, but also in Guyana. And that is so important because the UN, you know, we've been playing a major role in Guyana over the years. Of course, uh, we know uh, of the UN, a lot of persons have uh, been paying closer attention to the UN over the past couple of years as we maneuvered our way through the UN good offices process and eventually now on to the International Courts of Justice uh, for that uh, border case. So we understand the role that the UN has been playing. But I know several agencies work under uh, the UN umbrella here in Guyana. So can you tell us about the various agencies and the work that they do in Guyana before we go to some of the other representatives? Sure. Um, we have over 20 UN agencies, some of which are physically resident present here in Guyana, like my colleagues who represent their agencies. We have 10 resident agencies and another 10 plus um, non-resident agencies who serve Guyana through the Caribbean. Uh, you may know that uh, Guyana is part of the UN's world in terms of the English and Dutch speaking Caribbean. So we work very closely with our colleagues in Barbados, with our colleagues in Jamaica, because we share a lot of the problems, including being, um, you know, vulnerability to climate change, etc. So we have this team of UN um, organizations that work together to address some of the um, priority issues um, in, in the country. Some of them are here. But if I were to highlight one or two things that, that to me, as, as you said, I'm relatively new in the country. And when I came, I was most impressed by the response that we've been able to put together with respect to COVID. Um, and here, you know, I take, uh, again, um, I, I salute you for the very wonderful coverage you've been doing about COVID and vaccinations. 
with my colleagues from UNICEF and my colleague who's not here from WHO PAHO, they put together the COVAX facility, bringing to Guyana over 300,000 vaccinations. And I take advantage of this forum here for your audience to really go get vaccinated. We have benefited from generous contributions of our donors. Um, the only way to put this pandemic behind us is really to get vaccinated. So um, that's one of the main areas, but also our colleagues in um, the, our colleagues working with the um, refugee agency and, and our IOM, our migration organization representative is here, have made sure that the COVID response is not limited just to Georgetown. It, that it includes those who have needed help most. Um, and, and Jillian Smith from FAO is here also, but I've also been so imp impressed by the work um, colleagues have done to make sure that um, production of agricultural production continues through um, the COVID um, disruptions to supply chains and cycles. Um, so this is just a sense of the things that I've been most proud of on, on UN Day, reflecting on the work of, of UN. Of course, there are many others, and I hope my colleagues talk about those. And you know, uh, resident representative, a lot of times uh, when people talk about international organizations like the United Nations or like CARICOM, they don't realize the impact uh, many of the decisions could have on, on their lives, on the, the, uh, the country's uh, survival, how the country moves forward. I know there were the Millennium Development Goals, we're now the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, tell us about some of those and how do you think COVID has sort of impacted? Uh, we were paying close attention to the recent uh, UN General Assembly and a lot of the leaders who spoke at the UN General Assembly brought up those issues because many of them are facing some delays. So tell us about those Sustainable Development Goals and how countries have been sort of maneuvering uh, their way around all that's happening now and attaining those goals. Uh, thank you so much for that, for that question. The Sustainable Development Goals are a roadmap for the world to reduce poverty and to create a situation, a, a, a development for people in all sectors that, that impact them. For the first time in the UN history, we have an approach at development that is not focused solely on, let's say, agriculture or health or education, but that encompasses, that sees that people do not necessarily work through sectors of the UN. People live, their children get sick and need to go to school. Um, they, their daughters need to have a, a, a safe life on the street, but also uh, get you know, uh, more active in, in social political life. So the Sustainable Development Goals is really an integrated framework which speaks to the needs of families and, and individuals. And, and the 17 goals guides us in achieving, uh, in supporting um, uh, the government and the people of Guyana. Um, however, even before COVID, we were off track with the Sustainable Development Goals. There were many that we were not able to meet. And Sustainable Development Goals include, of course, the, the climate change related um, targets as well. And even before COVID, we were not getting anywhere near where we needed to be. And in Guyana, on many of those fronts, and I'll let my colleagues talk, speak to those more in, in depth, but at least with respect to, to climate, we all know based on the floods that happened right before I came mm -hmm. here, I'm looking out the window and I'm seeing the seawall. We are very, very, very vulnerable to climate change. So when the world did not meet its targets, that means Guyana will suffer, will not be able to prosper as much as it could. Um, and, and we are very vulnerable to climate change. So I just wanted to raise that, that before the um, COVID, we were off track. However, the Sustainable Development Goals continue to provide us a roadmap to recover out of COVID in a way not to go back to the way we were doing business before. There was something wrong with the way we were developing, not heating for the planet. <clears throat> So it gives us a roadmap to get back on track from COVID recovery and to get back on track towards prosperity and, and, and development for all. How is the UN, though, uh, before we move on to some of your other colleagues, how is the UN uh, going to sort of assist many of the countries moving forward? What are some of the plans uh, that you would have in place, let's say, for a country like Guyana uh, to assist us in a post-COVID environment? Um, first of all, I want to sort of dispel the notion that we are an assistance agency. 
of course, in many countries in, in, in Africa, in, in, in parts of Asia, the UN you know, comes and swoops in providing humanitarian assistance, running systems for those countries. In Guyana, our role has to be much different. We have a, an upper middle in, or a middle income country, middle income country with a lot of sophisticated ministerial and public administration capacity. So our role cannot be to just, we're not a financing agency here. Guyana's future in terms of financing is far brighter than ours in, in, in many respects. So in, in some ways, our role is to support the development processes so that they are inclusive so that they heed the carrying capacity of the environment, that they are future oriented, that we care, that we, we take development decisions so that we support Guyana, take development decisions that care for the future generations, so that we have the data, the analysis, so that we, we help, we support the government in making data-based, evidence-based decisions. I think that's, that would be a better way to summarize the role of the of the UN in, in, in a place like Guyana. Not like we, it's not, it, it's a different type of partnership with the government of Guyana. Yeah, thanks for making that clear. <laughs> I'm gonna bring in right now Mr. Irfan Akhtar, who is a UNICEF uh, deputy representative here in Guyana. Good day, sir, how are you doing? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity, Mr. Gordon. And uh, uh, this is a very special day, as our recent Cardin mentioned. Uh, UNICEF is always pleased to interact with you and uh, you know interact with your team. Uh, as you know, UNICEF is a United Nations uh, Children's Organization, uh, mandated to uphold the rights of children everywhere. Uh, especially when you talk about SDG era, which UNICEF tries to make sure that no no child is left behind. Uh, since uh, you know last 75 years unicef has been promoting the relation of child rights uh, in all countries all settings uh, including emergency and development context in ghana unicef has been working uh, for last uh, more than 30 years uh, supporting the line ministries as our is recorded and mentioned that we work very closely with the government partners we work very closely with our uh, uh, you know ngos faith based organizations we also work with the communities we work different stakeholders to make sure that all sectors, all partners are together uh, to real, realize the child rights. In Ghana, uh, mostly we have been uh, working and we are going to work in five, six sectors. Uh, and first sector and the first area of work is uh, to make sure that every child has access to health and nutrition. And especially you look uh, at the co impact of COVID pandemic, you know, it's very important that uh, we make sure that uh, there is uh, uh, sufficient services available to ch children everywhere especially uh, looking at uh, the challenges and difficulties in accessing services in remote and hinterland areas. Uh, we have been working very closely with the Ministry of Health to make sure that there is a sufficient availability of vaccines for children. And also uh, during the COVID time, uh, you know, as our resident government mentioned that uh, as our UNICEF together with Power WHO and with support from different development partners who are present in the country, we have been able to bring more than 300,000 of uh, different types of vaccines. I think Ghana is one of the few countries uh, which has multiple choice of vaccines. And so this is the time for everybody to take vaccines. And what we call them, that uh, we vaccines should be for all and all should be for vaccines <laughs> so that no one is left behind. And uh, you know, vaccine is the only hope for us okay. uh, to be safe, uh, to be protected, uh, 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 or also to protect others also and other fam our families and communities. The second area we have been uh, working and we are going to focus is uh, basically providing access to education for children and not only education, but also focusing on uh, developing skills, uh, you know, for employability uh, to, to, to be fit for purpose in 21st century, you know. It's not like what our technology. Uh, they are better equipped with, uh, you know, smart classrooms uh, and to be fit for purpose for 21st century skill. Uh, I would like to highlight here one of the challenges because of the COVID pandemic, you know, COVID has impacted everybody, everywhere. But uh, the most impacted I feel is children because for last almost 15, 16 months, they have not been able to get, go to school and they have been uh, missing the physical interaction with friends, the teachers. To develop their potential those are missing and they have been uh, you know uh, those who have been fortunate they have access online learning but there are many children uh, in ghana who did not have access to internet with 
they not have access to digital devices. Uh, so they have been missing those learning opportunities. So for us, the most important is to work with the Ministry of Education, uh, local institutions to make sure that uh, we are able to bring uh, them back in the school. Uh, also to find a ways to catch up on learning loss because they have not been in the school. There is a risk that uh, they will be yeah. missing so many learning opportunities There is learning loss. And the third area we are working and we feel that uh, it's important for us to work together is uh, safety and justice for children. If you look, uh, look at the data, uh, there is increased uh, you know, violence against children in many countries in Ghana also. And, uh, and we what? must appreciate that uh, the government and the stakeholders and partners have been working together to make sure that uh, the, you know there is a reduction in the violence in the children. So uh, we want to make sure that every child everywhere is fully protected from violence, uh, you know, exploitation, neglect, and abuse. And we look forward to the engagement of all his, his stakeholders, including media and Mr. Gordon. Your team also can play a vital role in uh, protecting rights of children. Uh, another area is uh, what we have been talking about, uh, and uh, our RC also mentioned, Rizinval mentioned about uh, that we don't work only in the development context, but also emergency context. And this pandemic is kind of one of the biggest emergencies for all of us. So UNICEF worked together with the different line ministries to make sure that, uh, to ensure the continuity of basic services, whether it's related to health, it's related to education, it's related to providing social protection support to the, some of the poor families in remote hinterland areas. So these are the few areas UNICEF is focusing, but at the same time, uh, we must realize that uh, we work together to build the capacity of the government partners, institutions, to be to be to be ready to provide all services all children need in the country. Thank you. I'll stop here. Yeah, Mr. Akhtar, uh, before you go, I know as you mentioned, uh, you've been working a lot in the field of education. From a local point, what are some of the things you've been seeing over the past year? You mentioned learning loss. That is something the education ministry has spoken about also, the fact that in many instances because of COVID-19 and schools being closed for such a long period, uh, while some children might have access to the internet and access to computers, uh, you know, we just saw results came out for some exams. And we also heard that over 500 children didn't write one particular exam. Not sure of the reason, but in terms of uh, Guyana and uh, COVID-19 and our children, what are some of the concerning issues that you may have seen over the past year that sort of raise your eyebrows? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, very good question, actually. And uh, this uh, question actually applies to all children everywhere. But in context of Guyana, since beginning of pandemic, uh, we have been working very closely with the Ministry of Education. Uh, to ensure the continuity of education. So we, 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 we try to work with the Ministry of Education to develop uh, learning materials through TV, through radio, through newspaper. But as you mentioned, there are many children who do not have access to these things, you know, these technologies, these devices. So more than 50,000 uh, learning materials we developed for those children who don't have access to either TV or radio. So those materials were printed and provided to those children in remote hinterland areas. So uh, there, there were uh, several efforts to make sure that uh, at least some kind of learning material is available to children, you know? So we use newspaper, TV, we use social media also to provide, we, we, we are supporting uh, learning material through WhatsApp groups to the parents and, and teachers. Uh, so we, we make sure that, you know, at least uh, uh, there is some kind of uh, technology, there is some kind of materials available, but I totally agree with you because of this pandemic, all children did not have equal opportunities to learn and grow and uh, you know fulfill their potential potential and there is the risk of learning loss so that's why the ministry of education has developed uh, you know uh, education sector plan uh, which puts a revisioning of the education sector plan to make sure that some of the challenges because of the covid pending pandemic are addressed in the education mm -hmm. sector plan and one of the issues I also feel is a digital divide. You know, we talk about uh, you know, access to technology. We talk about, you know, uh, uh, online platform. In Ghana, there is a, also a digital divide. So uh, moving ahead, mm -hmm. we need to all of us to make sure that we are narrowing the digital divide. We should be able to bridge the digital divide. And also, uh, when we talk about learning loss, uh, I will also I would like to encourage your parents, teachers, and families uh, you know, to 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 provide their commitment uh, and uh, spend their time with their children because uh, it, it requires participation of parents, teachers, and families to make sure that you know those learning loss are mitigated. 
and we have a, a mechanism in place to to fulfill those learning loss uh, just before you you uh, move on to dr smith i wanted to uh, raise with you the, the role of parents in all of this uh, because you know i've heard a lot of parents in the past year say uh, they're now back in school they're now teachers uh, because they find themselves sort of back in the classroom going over things they never thought they would have to but that sort of have that has sort of uh shine a new light on the role parents ought to be playing uh with the education of their children because a lot of times before covid and online teaching and online learning a lot of times it was just the teacher's job mm -hmm. now parents have found themselves also being that extra teacher that extra person in the classroom so moving forward what role do you see parents having to play in the education of their children other than just providing the necessary tools and uh facilities and so uh, i think this is the most most important question you ask because we have to demystify that uh, school and teachers are not the only place learning starts from beginning earlier stage from the home and from the family when we talk about early early childhood development, when we talk about early childhood education, it just starts with the family. So for me, the learning center is the family. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the first teacher is the, uh, are the parents, you know. So role of parents in, is, is very important uh, in terms of uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, creating learning environment at, at home, in terms of uh, uh, giving a stimulation for better learning at home. Uh, but maybe Irfan, maybe. Gordon, one thing that occurs to me is that there are some silver linings to COVID. Yeah, it's been a horrible impact on families. People have lost jobs. Schools have closed. But in some cases, we things will never be the same in terms of our relationship at home. We have spent so much more time at home. I have spent more time with my child the last year than I did all throughout my career. Yeah. And there is something positive well, about that. Yeah. Um, I, you know, there's no, there's, it's, it, it, it's very difficult to find the positives of COVID, but I think it has taught us certain things. Yeah. One, to care about one another, which is very relevant to the UN Day message I would like to give, to care about the people around us, yeah. um, to first start with our own family, yeah. to create uh, good environments for our family. I think we will never go back yeah. to how things were yeah. and we yeah. should not yeah, absolutely the future of work has changed a lot of my yeah. colleagues have worked from home other people have lost jobs and are trying to figure out how to adapt is there an opportunity that we don't go back into the sectors that were not decent work yeah. Yeah. that were not good jobs for people perhaps people there are opportunities in more sustainable sectors yeah. that are environmentally friendly so you know, really, how do we see COVID as an opportunity to emerge yeah. and, and, and you know, learn from what it meant for our children, children yeah. for our family, but also for our society? Are yeah. we able to care for others in a way that, you know, COVID has taught us we must yeah. by masking, by getting vaccinated, but Absolutely. also by helping when necessary? Yeah. No, uh, uh, just to compliment uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, this COVID has really, uh, we are talking about challenges, but opportunities <laughs> also, you know. Uh, many parents become a teacher you know and <laughs> also they have developed very good bonding you know the parental bonding with children which were not in the past probably we are not able to spend the time with the children you know so covid has given a lot of opportunities also uh, in unicef globally we have launched uh, we call reimagine education and in uh, because of the covid pandemic pandemic how education system have been challenged and uh, looking at learning loss i think there are different ways of uh, you know uh, doing the education system, improving the education system. So this is what we are talking about. We have to reimagine everything now. Exactly. It's not going to be the same what we used to be in the previous years, but uh, everything we need to change our perspective, the way we work, the way we are going to uh, deal with our children in school and at home. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot for all of that. Uh, I'm moving on to the Food and Agriculture Organization because that also falls under uh, the United Nations. And we know the FAO, you've been playing a good role in Guyana over the years, and this is your month. It's Agriculture yeah. Month here in Guyana, so he must be pretty excited about that, though a lot of stuff is being done virtually. I've been Absolutely. covering agriculture for uh, almost 20 years, and I remember one of my first experiences uh, covering Agriculture Month. Uh, this was way back when I had hair and I was much younger. It was way back <laughs> in 1999, I think, 
and we traveled all the way to Berbiz. And it was amazing uh, to see the food and the agriculture and the farmers uh, come out. Because for me, as someone who comes from a mining community, and now you're being exposed to agriculture, you know, you, it was sort of you seeing where the food comes from. You had a bit of understanding mm -hmm. of what the farmers go through. And so we want to bring in Dr. Jillian Smith, who is the FAO representative here in Guyana, uh, focusing on food and agriculture. Uh, Dr. Smith, thanks again for joining us. A happy UN Day to you too. Uh, tell us about the role the FAO has been playing in Guyana over the years, uh, and especially now when we have climate change and we saw what happened to many of our farmlands earlier this year. So how has your role sort of adjusted to all of that? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, we have been very active this year, uh, sorry, this month. Um, we have been working very closely, particularly with our, our counterparts in the Ministry of Agriculture, who have been doing a tremendous job, I think, in showcasing agriculture. But beyond just agriculture, as people think of it, towards really food systems, and we've talked about this before, Gordon, um, really thinking about the whole big picture from farm really to fork, um, the producers, the persons who do distribution, who do processing, right through to all our consumers. And so this year, it's really been important for us to highlight that. Um, you would also be aware that in September of this year, the, the UN Global Food Systems Summit was held and Guyana played a very active part. Mm -hmm. In fact, no less than the, the, His Excellency, the president of Guyana, indicated that Guyana is continuing to commit itself to transforming its food system in a way that is going to make it sustainable environmentally, mm -hmm. inclusive of everyone, providing decent livelihoods and work as well, and ensuring that everyone has a healthy, affordable diet. So there is great ambition around what is happening in agriculture now. And this is actually part of what FAO, you know, a lot of how our work has changed recently. We're working, a lot of people think of us as the agriculture and the forestry and the fisheries agency of the UN. But I think this broader look at how we work, um, encompassing nutrition, encompassing resilience of systems, food systems, food production systems, food trade and distribution systems against external shocks, ensuring that the sustainable, our resources, the natural resources of the countries, um, in particular Guyana, which is abundantly blessed, mm -hmm. are available for the next generations. Um, RC mentioned decent work. So all of these are how a new way that we're working, a more integrated way. We do not work by ourselves. We work very closely with the Ministry of Agriculture, but also the other ministries and counterparts. We work also with civil society and we work with academia. But most importantly, we work with other development partners to support Guyana's agenda and we have to do this especially with our sister agencies when we talk about food security we're talking about more than agriculture and agriculture production we are really talking about how well our systems are sustaining us um, we're talking about the consumption how well we are our bodies are being nourished how well our children are being nourished for productive and healthy lives we're talking about how well we, we, we change our systems to ensure that we can meet the challenges of climate change. This is not the work of any one person or any one agency or entity. So that's the main way, Gordon, I would say that our work has changed over the years. Uh, in terms of a country like Guyana that you've been working closely uh, with over the many years at the FAO, the UN, you've been here, uh, tell us, uh, in terms of diversification in the agriculture sector, is that something uh, you assist with? Is that something you assist the agriculture ministry to sort of guide with? Because you know, a lot of times we go into the marketplaces and you see us importing a lot of the food. Yeah. Uh, you know, the farmers can be growing here. So that's something you've been sort of assisting with. And how do you see yourself playing a role there? Yeah, um, we 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 have so many ways that we can support. You know. It's been very clear, particularly over the last few years, Guyana has very much signaled that it wants to diversify its agriculture. 
for many reasons, and, and I think it's an important and a vital way forward. Guyana has also signaled that it wants to be playing a more important role in intra-regional trade in the Caribbean. So we, we try to assist at many different levels and according to what we're asked. And there are a couple of things that come to me at the moment. One of them is, of course, with the, the producers, your agricultural producer base, your, your farmers, it is vitally important that they are they, they have the tools and the knowledge that is required, not for them, not just for them to be able to do well with what they're doing now, but to introduce new types of crops, new types of, of production practices, so that they are able to be fit for the markets that are going to emerge, that continue to emerge, that Guyana can take advantage of now, five years from now, 10 years from now. The work to be able to access those markets and to ensure that all farmers can access those markets, that work takes place right now. There's also quite a bit of work that we're doing at, I would call it the regional or maybe Caribbean region level. We're working with the countries and Guyana is included. In fact, Guyana, as you know, leads the working group on food security in CARICOM. We're working with the countries to be able to work out how do we improve intra-regional trade? Mm -hmm. What are, the, what are the, the binding constraints and how can we address those? One thing that COVID has definitely taught us is that supply chain mm -hmm. interruptions are going to create some serious problems for us. We are already producing enough food in the world to be able to feed us all. The issue that seems to be the case is that because of supply chain interactions, very often that food can be too expensive for some people. And these are things that we can work around. These are things that we can fix together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the areas that we are kind of working in as well. And, you know, we're looking forward to continuing to work with Guyana on this. Guyana has a very bright future in food systems and in agriculture. And we're happy to be walking this path with with, with you. But is there a concern uh, that with all that's happening in Guyana, in the mining sector, particularly in the oil and gas sector, mm -hmm. uh, that moving forward, we can see uh, persons drifting away uh, from agriculture? I know we talk a lot about Guyana returning as the food basket of the Caribbean. We talk a lot about the importance of agriculture, but we're also dealing with a lot of young people who are driven in different direction. They're, they're more inclined to turn to technology and many of them may not see uh, the need to really focus on the agriculture sector. It might not be as sexy as some of the jobs available out there. Uh, so do you think there is that concern? And how do we keep our young people interested in the agriculture sector, in the food sector, and understanding that the many sectors that they might be looking at are also dependent on food and agriculture? Yeah, no, you're so right. And you know, um, as, as a farmer said to me the other day, no matter what else happens, no matter how much oil we have, people have to keep eating. And this is absolutely true. Um, you know, the, the thing now for us is, you, you know, we know globally there is a trend where the average age of the producer, of the farmer, is actually getting higher and higher. You know, so it's not just the problem of Guyana. This is a, a Caribbean-wide problem. It's a global problem. But there are a few things. One of the things is, um, you know, I know you, you would have heard it. We all heard it when probably when we were in school, somebody, some teacher said to us, work smarter as well as harder. Sometimes they said not harder, but <laughs> work smarter is important. There are tremendous opportunities, technological, digital opportunities that are now available, tools that didn't exist one generation ago that can be applied to agriculture production and not just production, agriculture trade, agriculture distribution that can help to make that work more attractive to young persons, but also more efficient and more effective. And lucrative. And yeah. lucrative, and exactly lucrative. so. Exactly. Young people these days, they people want to make money. Of Absolutely. Course. Agriculture is a business. <laughs> sure. um, but I think as well, 
I, I think we, we really have a generation coming forward that is also has a very high level and sense of social responsibility mm -hmm. and environmental responsibility. Mm -hmm. To my mind, this is the area that we need to be able to look at and understand and work with young people to understand how can agriculture, how can food systems and their part in food systems actually be welded or, or, or work together with these things that are important to them. And I'll say it again, because I do think it's very important, Gordon, this is a multi-sectoral, multi-institutional issue. It's this is something that goes exactly yeah. beyond just thinking of it strictly in terms of agriculture. Yeah. I'm very happy you spoke about the need to work smarter and in the agriculture sector, uh, because just the other day I was uh, watching a documentary and they were showing you how farmers in one American village, uh, how they have transitioned from using the airplanes to sprinkle pesticides oh, and yeah. to now using drones. And now they have yeah. to hire someone in a particular technological yeah. field to do yeah, something yeah. like that, who might not have seen themselves using a drone exactly. for that type yeah. of work. So, you know, I'm very happy that you sort of showed us how uh, they can bring in those various agencies. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, Gordon, and I think it's really important also, you know, to remember that there actually are some very good examples, I think, of, of good initiatives that are taking place here in Guyana. And some of those, they need to be highlighted, they need to be scaled up. One of the benefits that the UN can bring as well is we also can bring examples and experiences that are being used in, in other, other places, places. Mm -hmm. and bring that and help to drive innovation and drive the innovative spirit that is already here in Guyana. That is a very good thing. Uh, we're going to move on now to our fourth uh, guest today. His name is Robert Natalio. He is the Chief of Mission for the International Organization for Migration. Uh, so I was driving into the office and I was listening to radio and there was this ad and they were talking about the Venezuelan migrants and the need uh, for us to be respective of them, uh, you know, and xenophobia and all of that has been happening. So you seem as though you have a lot on your plate over <laughs> at the IOM. So tell us about the International Organization for Migration and the role you've been playing in Guyana, uh, particularly uh, with migrants who've been seeking help in this country. First of all, thanks very much, uh, Gordon, for, for this opportunity to talk about the work of, of IOM. Um, I, I'd like to say a couple of things before I answer your question. And, and what I'd like to say is that uh, IOM really is the newest member of, <laughs> of the United Nations. Um, and IOM uh, is what we call a UN-related organization. Uh, we're sort of formally part of the UN family, which we welcome, uh, but we've been sort of an international intergovernmental organization for a long time. Uh, we've always worked closely with the UN. We've always had a great relationship with the UN. But in 2016, we uh, joined the UN as a result of the first high-level dialogue on migration and refugees, on, on migrants and refugees, which took place in New York at the UN General Assembly. It was the first high-level dialogue on, on migration to address issues of migration. So uh, I think it's apt that I've, I've come last, that I'm bringing up the rear because I really am sort of the newest <laughs> uh, kid on the block, so to speak. Um, but it is an, an honor to be uh, more formally within the UN system. Um, IOM is committed to the principle that regular, orderly, and safe migration benefits migrants and societies. And when I say societies, I mean the societies from which those migrants originate, but also the societies to which those migrants migrate. Um, now, uh, you know, the issue of the migration dynamic in Guyana is changing. Uh, and I think everyone recognizes that. Uh, you know, traditionally, Guyana has been what we call a source country for migrants or a, a, a country which, from which migrants emigrate. Uh, traditionally, uh, in, in the modern era, I would say, of course, you know, uh, the fact that we have Afro-Guyanese and Indo-Guyanese Indo implies that there was also migration into Guyana at a previous period in, in the country's history when it was still sort of a colony, right? But in the modern era, many migrants have left the country. 
Um, and now we're seeing some changes there, right? Uh, and we're seeing a lot of migrants come into Guyana. Uh, some of those are Venezuelan. Uh, some of those are Cuban and Haitian migrants. Uh, so what we often say is that uh, Guyana is a source country for migrants. It's the host country for migrants, but it's also a transit country for migrants. Some migrants come into the country, they don't stay, they, they leave the country maybe in an irregular manner. So there are a lot of migration challenges. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to say something that each one of my colleagues has stressed here today. We have a, uh, a framework, we call it the migration governance framework. And the migration governance framework has three principles and three objectives. And the third principle is good migration governance relies on strong partnerships. And IOM feels, uh, and it's our principle, that we need to work together to address these issues of migration. Uh, by its very nature, migration and mobility imply a number of different actors. Uh, we're talking about uh, states, right? So migrants are moving from one state to, to other states, right? So there are relationships there that the states need to manage. And then you have uh, at the regional level, uh, there's a lot of sort of, uh, you know, intra-regional migration in the Caribbean. The Caribbean is a, is a region that's been defined by migration throughout its history, right? Um, and then you have local actors, right, that are also really uh, important in, in addressing these issues of migration. Uh, and migration cuts across a range of different uh, socioeconomic, demographic, political uh, sectors, right? So there are a number of actors who, are, who, are, who need to be involved in migration. There are a number of ministries who need to be involved in migration. Uh, 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 one example is, you know, there are children who migrate and there are children who migrate by themselves. And obviously they have special needs and vulnerabilities so we need to work closely with UNICEF to address those issues of children migrants, right? And how do we make sure that they're protected uh, and that their needs are met and that they're in school and that, and that if they're in school and they speak a different language, how can we ensure that, you know, they're getting the education needs uh, and services that, that they require? Um, so again, migration really requires this, what we call whole of government and whole of society approach. Um, now, uh, you did mention Venezuelan migrants. Uh, certainly, uh, that's one of these sort of new dynamics that, that Guyana is facing in terms of migration. Um, of course, you know, the situation in Venezuela is worrisome. And I think that the government of Guyana deserves a lot of recognition uh, in the way it's handled migration from Venezuela. We all know there's a border controversy. Venezuela says that part of Guyana's territory is theirs. It's an incredibly, it's an incredibly complex political situation. Um, but the government of Guyana also recognizes that there was a period when many of uh, when many Guyanese went to Venezuela, and Venezuela let them come into the country and kind of settle and start families and start businesses. And the government of Guyana has said, "Look, we recognize that the situation in Venezuela is difficult." We would also like to, um, you know, we don't want to send people back or deport people to a situation where they don't have enough food to eat, uh, they can't find work, they don't have medical services, right? Um, and, and so the government of Guyana really has done an admirable job to try to address this issue. Uh, but it also requires, you know, the work of, of those of us on the ground uh, and, and our, our brothers and sisters and fellow citizens, right? And that's where the issues of xenophobia come in. Uh, we have to understand and put ourselves in the shoes of migrants um, so that, you know, uh, there's not that xenophobia and there's not that negative reaction. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we kind of work together? So a lot of our work does involve trying to integrate Venezuelans into the society. That includes, you know, teaching them English, uh, helping them to develop skills so that they can find work, um, uh, providing their sort of immediate humanitarian needs of food and shelter um and clothing and, and whatever else they might need healthcare services right uh so uh, there are many many challenges around migration rooms for kids or whatever it might be or um you know st strengthening the, the agricultural system 
but that's very um, politically it's, it's sort of easy to accept that migration is more challenging there, there are some difficult political elements that we have to manage there so uh, and, and that's everywhere that's not Guyana I mean mm -hmm. migration is a challenge politically in every country around the world right so um, yeah I, I wanted to say I wanted to mention that uh, but there's more to migration than the, than the Venezuelan migration. I think we've heard the vice president say recently that, you know, Guyana could very easily reach full employment by, you know, in the coming months and years, right? So we need to bring workers into the country. How do we bring workers into the country in a way that is, uh, you know, well managed, uh, that migrants uh, are able to integrate easily into the society, into their work? Uh, these are all uh, efforts that IOM uh, wishes to work with the government of Guyana and to share our experiences in, you know, from other countries around the world, because we've done these types of things uh, and we want to support the government in these processes. Uh, and our role really is to, you know, to, to help Guyana, to work with the government of Guyana, to, to manage those migration challenges that the country will face and, and faces now, uh, in, you know, going forward. Um, so, Gordon, the challenges are many. My plate is definitely full, but uh, I'm, I'm happy to do the work. It's, it's, uh, there's never a dull moment, as we say. I'd like to mention one other thing, if I can, and I'd like to go back to FAO for a second, because we used to have a bumper sticker in my country. We still have a bumper sticker in my country that's very common, and it's very simple. It says, no farmers, no food. I mean, <laughs> you have to have farmers, right? Um, and that's another area where, you know, migrants are coming into the country, and some of them are farmers. So, you know, uh, how do we work with them to kind of boost their production? So they're not dependent on humanitarian right. assistance for food, right? I mean, th this is another example of kind of how we work together with, with our partner agencies. Thank you, Gordon. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, but as one of our listeners, uh, viewers, uh, she's pointing out, Chevron Sears, uh, she's saying that uh, it's sort of a new phenomenon to Guyana. We're always accustomed to Guyanese going other places, not people coming here. And yeah. so to many persons, it's sort of a culture shock. It's, it's not something they know how to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, so what role do you see the IOM having to play in the future to sort of make Guyanese more aware of these migration issues, how to treat foreigners who are coming into the country, and how they have to work together, how they can share experiences, how they can benefit from each other? That's a great question, and I, I you know, it, it touches on what I said at the beginning. I mean, these are the changes that Guyana is facing in terms of the world is facing. The world is facing, yeah. and, and, and Guyana is not the only country. Yeah. That's correct. And even in countries that have sort of a lot of, let's say, migratory experience, and they have, they're used to having immigrants come in. There's still xenophobia there. I mean, that that's not, you know, that's not something that's unique to Guyana, uh, and it's it's a challenge everywhere. Um, but you know. You know, some of the things that we do involve sort of uh, setting up, you know, intercultural activities, um, uh, you know, playing sports and developing sporting activities, uh, you know, teaching, uh, teaching Venezuelans cricket and, 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 and Venezuelans coming in and, and working with Guyanese to teach football, for example, mm -hmm. or soccer, as I call it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But um but anyway, you know, there, there are a lot of sort of uh, opportunities for this uh, cultural integration. The cultural integration part is, uh, is a need. It, it's a need that we see everywhere. Yeah. Um, and we try to sort of foster these spaces in common where people can come together to, and understand each other and learn from each other, as, as you and, and I think your listener said. Um, there, there are, you know, sort of countless opportunities and, and we've undertaken sort of a number of activities to try to, uh, you know, to try to address the issue. Uh, and it's not something that will change overnight. I mean, I think we all have to work on this and it's, it's much more, you know, medium and long term work. Gordon, maybe I, I'd also like to perhaps say, and just from a personal perspective, I think that Guyana and Guyanese people are naturally warm and welcoming. Yeah. There is a, an incredible, you know, culture of, of, of really decent, warm, welcoming, um, you know, way that the people here Chief are. Other, yeah. And I also want to add that I think institutions, Guyanese institutions and government as well, you know, 
there, there is a general sense of always welcoming and helping. So naturally in the DNA of Guyana, it's already there. I think the value added that we as the UN can bring is, we know this quickly becomes an overwhelming situation. Very and we company. have a lot of experience working with other countries and so on. And we can help to bring some of that to support the work and the, you know, the way that Guyana naturally works and, 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 and welcomes. Yeah. And, and if I could say one other thing there, actually, which touches a little bit on what, what Jillian just said. You know, look, we understand that, you know, specifically for this issue of migration for Venezuela, uh, there's, you know, there are a number of communities that have received migrants and they are welcoming, as Jillian said. Uh, so those host communities, the, there are increased pressures on those host communities. There are limited resources in a lot of the, the, the communities in the interior regions. Um, so we don't sort of go to those regions just to assist Venezuelan migrants, right? Mm -hmm. We also try to see how we can also assist the host community so that, that we're, we're not creating sort of any sort of social division or, or social conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and, yeah. I, yeah. and I think, yeah, and I was going to say, Robert, that I think too, we also work with the institutions and we know the government institutions, the national institutions, um, I would say non, not for profit organizations and entities, churches, you know, there's a lot of help and support. One of the things we want to be able to do is to, to provide those entities as well with, with tools and support and, mm -hmm. to, to be able to do what they are doing better. That's, that goes back to those strong partnerships. We yeah. really do have to work in partnership with, yes, uh, civil society organizations, religious organizations, uh, yeah. all the UN agencies uh, to address these issues, really. I mean, uh, to adequately manage migration, we all have to come together. I think, yeah. No, just I wanted to say that uh, I totally agree that it requires a multi-sector approach. And also, I would like to appreciate the initiative of the government of Ghana to establish a multi-stakeholder multi coordination committee for migrants. Correct. And this is a very good platform to discuss those issues, challenges, and strategies to deal with the situation. Correct. And we stand ready to cooperate and support, of course, the committee yeah. and, and the leadership of the country in managing this, what otherwise could be a really overwhelming challenge. Yeah. Um, but we think we have the resources, the Guyana has the resources and the right and, and the heart's in the right place, as yeah. they say, yeah. um, to, well, to manage. Well, how do you deal with a society like Guyana where you might have uh, one segment of a society welcoming to one set of migrants and you have another segment that might be more welcoming to another group of migrants? How do you all uh, deal with that? How, what is the message you would put out there? What advice would you give to the government of how do you address a situation like that, where all migrants may not be treated equally? Um, well, I, I can only um, reiterate the message of the UN Day, which is that all human beings are equal and enjoy equal rights. Men, women, regardless of race, ethnicity, and, and religion, um, they enjoy, and, and I would urge the government and our non-governmental partners to recall today on UN Day, the, the um, human rights principles, the rights of, 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 of individuals, men and women, um, uh, the equal rights of men and women. So I think drawing back to the human rights notion that that really encompasses what our organization um, is all about, what it stands for, will be my recommendation and my advice to recall the core principles of the organization. Yeah. Yeah. As we get ready to wrap up, of course, uh, for those of you who've been uh, paying a, paying a, uh, paying attention and playing a part, we celebrate the United Nations Day. It was uh, back in 1945 that that charter was signed, and so we're observing that day today, the 24th of October. Uh, of course, the United Nations, they recently had the General Assembly meeting at the UN headquarters in New York City. And so we're talking with some of the uh, various representatives for the various agencies that fall on the United Nations and the work that they have been doing here in Guyana. As we get ready to wrap up, I'm gonna go back uh, to the UN resident coordinator, Yasin Oruk, and I'm gonna come back to you uh, because we've been paying attention and almost in every agency, COVID has been playing a really uh, a dreadful role uh, sort of in those agencies affecting the work of those agencies, affecting the work of the country moving forward. Yeah. I know vaccination is a big thing. The UN has been pushing uh, vaccination. 
Uh, so again, um, as we get ready to wrap up, I know you would have a message about vaccination, the importance of getting vaccinated, and the importance of following guidelines uh, here in Guyana. Um, thank you, Gordon. And again, I want to thank you for your thoughtful coverage of this issue in your other programs and other interviews that I've had the privilege to, to watch. As we said at the outset, the only way to put the pandemic behind us is by getting vaccinated. We are so lucky in Guyana to actually have the vaccines and the choice of vaccines um, to, to go ahead and get vaccinated. Um, that, 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 that will be the only way we put this behind us. But also as we emerge from this, I too have been quite impressed with the capacity that the government has put in place in terms of COVID assistance. It will be very important that such assistance is reaching those who need it most. Um, it, you know, it, it was a really tough year, huh? Not only COVID, but also floods. Yeah. So all kinds of, you know, the, the, the mm -hmm. COVID has made it possible for us to imagine things that were politically unimaginable. Yeah universal assistance for, for COVID, yeah. you know, loss of income, et cetera. And Guyana has really been quite progressive in, in providing this kind of assistance to um, flood victims, to code, you know, to, for, for getting um, the, the COVID relief. So I, I congratulate that, but the, it's not over. The only way to put it behind us is for all of us to get vaccinated and continue to wash the hands uh, make sure social distancing. We're right here, a little too close to one another right now, but we're only four people in the room, <laughs> and we're all fully, fully vaccinated. Um, so um, I, I hope the Minister of Health doesn't mind that we've done this. <laughs> uh, and so again, and thank you uh, for playing a part uh, today in this uh, discussion. Uh, as we wrap up, I know it's United Nations Day. Uh, tell us about how you all got started on a personal level, how you all got started with the United Nations and what it has been like for you in your various fields at the UN. So you want us to tell about how we got started? <laughs> yeah, tell us about how you got involved, how you, how you ended that big job at the UN. I, I think we need to do a sitcom for that, like a long <laughs> show with all of us starring in different roles. I, that, that, that would be really, really fantastic. But Gordon, if, if you don't mind, just one thing I would like to say is, you know, we all come to the UN from different doors, different yeah. entry points, different agencies for different reasons. Yeah. It could be commitment to human rights, commitment to social development, economic issues. We all come to it from different places. But right now in Guyana, we have over 100 men and women who work for the United Nations. And on this UN day, they include our you know, executive assistants, assistants, drivers, our custodial staff. They include senior members of the team. But they, I, I want to highlight that it, they include a lot of people at different walks of life from different countries, mostly Guyanese. And it's to them who have chosen to join us here in Guyana that I am most thankful for. We all have our different stories of how we got started. Yeah. Um, I started in my home country. I'm Turkish American. I started in Turkey because I cared about the development of my country. I was concerned about inequalities and human rights issues in my country. Yeah. That's why I started working for, for the UN. I'm sure we all had different yeah, ones, exactly. but um, or similar ones or different ones, but um, it is really the Guyanese staff of the yeah. UN that I want to thank, um, the, the ones who work here, who have entered our doors yeah. and who have um, chosen this journey, with, with yeah. what I call the noble journey. Yeah, exactly. um, there is nothing that beats being yeah. a UN, somebody who works for the United Nations. Um, I have been always so proud of working for the UN. Um, I've always felt that no matter who I'm sitting across the table from, it could be a head of state or the richest person in the country, I am the UN representative. Absolutely. And that to me puts us apart from everything else. We work for a noble goal of human rights, prosperity, and, 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 and treating people equally and taking care of one another and peace. Um, and, and therefore, I'm very proud of, of the work we do and the work of all our staff. Yeah. And I want to thank you for the work you've been all been doing uh, in Guyana and with the United Nations. And thank you, too, for what the UN has been doing here in Guyana. I know it's a busy place. I spent six weeks at the UN headquarters. And when they say the UN is a melting pot, trust me, <laughs> it really is. Every day you met someone from some other place and everyone had a different story. 
and yeah. sort of tell, told you that, you know, everyone has a story to tell. And it's so good to be there for six weeks every day and really mm -hmm. getting an understanding of all these different agencies of the UN work. And so on this UN day, I want to thank you for the job you all do here in Guyana. And I thank you for spending an hour of your Sunday with me as we sort of celebrate UN Day virtually. I know you're gonna, but everyone's going to head back to their homes and do their own little quiet celebration, uh, <laughs> sip, sip on something. I want to also thank uh, the language interpreter who's been, the sign language interpreter who's been keeping up a company. His name is Mikuanya Yosef Israel. Hope I got the pronunciation right. Five stars if I do. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for being here today. And really thank you for the job you do and will continue to do here in Guyana. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you for celebrating our birthday with us. And yeah. Thanks thank a lot. You. And to all of the persons who stay tuned for us uh, with us for the past hour, I want to thank you too for tuning in. And again, happy United Nations Day. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great day today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.